there was this guy and he was really stressed out. He had so much going on. He was very consumed with the events of the day. So he decided he needed to do some self-care as Dan and John have suggested. So he thought, what's the thing that I could do that would totally get me out of my normal routine? I'm going to go horseback riding. So he books a trip and he goes out to this dude ranch and he finds this old rancher who's been working with horses his whole life. And, and he said, pick me out your best horse. So the rancher comes out and he says, this is the horse that you need to go on your journey with. But I want you to know that this is a spiritual horse. And the man looked at him. And he said, what do you mean spiritual horse? And he says, it's a spiritual horse. He says, if you want this horse to go, if you want it to move, he says, you got to say, praise the Lord. And if you want the horse to stop, you have to say, hallelujah. And the guy's like, are you kidding me? And the rancher's like, I'm serious. If you want the horse to go, you got to say, praise the Lord. If you want it to stop, hallelujah. So the guy climbs on the horse and he's like, oh, brother. And so he's like, come on, horse, let's go. Let's go. Giddy up. The horse isn't moving. Come on. Let's go, horse. Let's go. Giddy up. Horse is not moving. So finally, the guy says, oh, <laughs> Praise the Lord. And the horse rears up and takes off, galloping at full speed. And the guy's just hanging on. He's like, oh my gosh. He's just hanging on this horse, hanging on this horse. He's like, stop, stop, slow down. The horse isn't stopping. Eventually, they get so far down the road that this horse is moving towards the edge of a cliff and he's not slowing down. And the guy's like, stop, stop, stop. Horse isn't slowing. Stop, stop, stop. Finally, he remembers. Hallelujah. And the horse er, stops right at the edge of the cliff. And the guy goes, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> so words matter right and today i want to take you on a journey back a half a million years ago to the time when the neanderthals the cavemen as we say generically back when the neanderthals uh roamed the earth and the neanderthals uh roamed for about half a million years people say and um and so they were strong, tough, built to handle the ice age. And they were our ancestors and they were strong and they were resourceful. And one of the things that happened to their brain because their brain was very primordial. It was very animalistic in the very beginning. Half a million years ago, our brain was built to survive and survive only. And so the brain began to develop systems to prepare itself from danger. So if there was an animal lurking in the bushes, all of a sudden we would get this sense that would come off that we call stress or anxiety. And it was designed to keep people safe. It was designed to help people feel secure. It was designed to protect people from danger. So if they were um, around an enemy or they were around a bush and there was an animal hiding, all of a sudden they would get this feeling that would go off inside and it was designed to prepare them, not scare them. Well, as we adapted through the years, we started um, honing in on that sense. And our brain began to hardwire these two systems into us. And the first one was the fight or flight response. And that is when we feel stress and anxiety. All of a sudden, our senses become more aware. We become more alert. We become more tunnel vision on what's happening in the moment. Our body releases adrenaline and cortisol into the brain and into the blood so that we are able to run away from danger or run into it in order to defend or save or rescue or ward off you know, potential threats. And so it is a very useful and powerful um, resource to have inside of us. Sometimes people want to get rid of anxiety or stress, and I don't think that's a good idea. I'm not sure you can anyway, but it's not a good idea because it's there to serve you. It's there to prepare you, not scare you. Although most people are scared and seized and controlled by their fight and flight response because they haven't learned how to control it. They haven't learned how to activate their relaxation response. That was the second system that was developed in your brain. It was designed to calm and cool you down afterwards. Because if you're running on high gear all the time, you'll burn out. It's like uh, being a race car that never takes pit stops. It's, it won't finish the race. And so the relaxation response is the part of us that allows us to feel more peaceful, more safe, more secure, more resourceful, 
so that we're able to make more logical decisions. We have our prefrontal lobes that were developed over you know, millions of years that allow us to be more rational, more calm, and to be able to make good choices instead of just reacting based on old instincts from the past. A lot of times we react in situations and then afterwards we have to make things better because we created more problems than there actually were. Like people freaking out and buying up all the toilet paper, right? They actually created a problem that did not exist before. And it wasn't a, a because of the coronavirus, it was because people panicked. Somebody got an idea that you end up with diarrhea and we were gonna run out of toilet paper and it spread faster than the coronavirus. And so our fear and anxiety can cause problems that don't exist. You know, we're creating the very pain that we're trying to avoid. So it's important to learn how to develop and or how to activate your relaxation response so that you feel more peaceful and more at ease. So I want you to think of your anxiety. Anxiety is like a fire alarm inside, a built-in fire alarm that keeps getting pulled or activated when there's no fire. We get into the habit of anxiety. We get into the habit of scaring ourselves rather than preparing ourselves. And I say it's a habit because we practice it so much at an unconscious level that it feels like it's just happening and we don't realize that we are helping to create it. We are creating this self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak, by what we are focusing on, what we're telling ourselves. And one of the things that we do is we tell ourselves that we don't have time to follow through on all those self-care tips that John uh, had shared with you, right? We tell ourselves that we don't have time or we have this faulty belief that if we let our guards down, something worse will happen. So I want you to imagine this metaphor. Imagine that human beings are like a teapot. We're like a tea kettle and we are going on the fire and the fire is life. The fire is stress. And as teapots, we are built to handle the stress of the fire, okay? However, if you don't take that teapot off that fire and allow it to cool down here and there, then you hit a boiling point and whoo, you blow your steam, right? And all of a sudden, we're into anxiety and making poor choices out of fear instead of being in control. So our job is to learn how to take ourselves off the fire. Use those self-care tips, those self-management tips. Cool down. Know that this is a very valuable part of your ability to stay, stay secure and of your ability to lead. Then you're going to get back on that fire because you're built for it. You're designed for it. This webinar was made for you, right? So you're designed to be in that position because you're good at it. But every once in a while, no matter how good you are, you have to take yourself off that fire and cool back down. So how do you activate the fight or flight anxiety response? And how do you activate the relaxation response? Well, we create these emotional states. An emotional state is a feeling. You can feel confident, you can feel depressed, you can feel outgoing and you can feel shy. You can create a sense of ease and you can create a sense of panic. You can feel ecstasy and you can feel worry. You can generate any kind of emotional feeling that you want. It's just that most people don't know how to do it intentionally. We're mostly just reacting based on what's going on in the situation and more importantly, based on the beliefs that we have developed as children. And so those unconscious beliefs cause us to see the world as a safe place, as a dangerous place, as a school, as a box of chocolates. And sometimes people think that life's a bitch and then you die. It's your, it's your interpretation of life that determines how you feel. There's an old um, ancient phrase in the Jewish book, the Talmud, and it says, you don't see the world as you are, or you don't see the world as it is, you see the world as you are. So if we want to create any kind of feeling, this is how you do it. We're going to focus on how you hold your body, your physiology, what you're focusing on and what you're imagining in the theater of your mind and then what you're saying to yourself in your own head. So let's break it down for anxiety. If you want to fire off or activate the fight or flight response and be full of anxiety, here's how you do it. One, your physiology, your body. You're gonna breathe through your mouth, short, shallow, upper chest, or you can hold your breath for maximum anxiety, right? So, 
<sighs> right? When you breathe short, fast, tight, like you're hyperventilating, it causes the body to get tight. If you want to feel anxious, you want to hold as much tension in your body as possible. You want to walk around feeling tight. You want to hold that stress in. You want to hold it all in. I know a lot of first responders are great at holding it all in, thinking that they're lifting and carrying around the weight of the world. But that is not a good practice. It's important to let that out, to delegate and share that pressure with others, not hold it in so that your heart blows up. And now how are you, out, hey, how are you supposed to help anybody else if you can't you know, be there, if, if you are not taking care of yourself? So self-care is essential for leadership. But if you're firing off the fight or flight response, then you've got to hold that energy in and you also have to speed up. Now, I've been helping people with anxiety for 25 years. And the thing that I've noticed more than anything else is you cannot feel anxious in slow motion. It's impossible. Try to feel like you're having a panic attack in slow motion. You can't do it, right? You'll be bored, but you won't be panicky. So what you want to do is if you're going to want to feel anxious, you need to speed up, right? So you just need to be moving around faster. You need to be talking faster. You should swear and cuss a lot, right? Because that will activate that adrenaline inside of you. Then what you do with your mind is you focus on all the images, all the things, all the outcomes that you don't want, okay? You want to focus on what you don't want. You want to focus, if you have flowers and, and weeds in a garden, your job, if you want anxiety, is to water the weeds so that they keep growing and you get more of them. So in your mind, play worst case scenarios. That's what people do when they're scaring themselves. Make scary future events or hurtful memories from the past. Make them big and large and clear in your face, right? And keep playing scary images over and over and over, especially when you lay down to go to sleep at night because then you won't be able to sleep. And that really helps to promote anxiety if that's what you want. Then the third thing you do is you talk to yourself in a specific way. You tell yourself things are not going to work out. You be discouraging, non-supportive, and critical of yourself and others. So in your mind, you're holding your body tight. You're focusing on what you don't want. You're telling yourself it's not going to work out. We're not going to be able to make it. We're not going to be able to survive. We're not going to be able to pay our bills. Everybody's going to die. We're all screwed. And that will cause you to want to hide under your bed. And that is what most people are doing in the world right now. So what do we do different? Well, the first thing we do is everybody take a slow breath in through your nose, breathe down to your belly, breathe in. And then we slowly exhale. And we start to take our power back. Now, how do you activate your relaxation response? How do you get calm so that you can be resourceful? So you can take control and handle any situation that shows up. It's not what shows up. It's how you show up that matters more than anything else. So the first thing you do with your physiology is basically the exact opposite. You start to breathe in through your nose. You breathe down to your belly, slow and deep. Breathe in through your nose, slowly exhale. If you wanna make that stronger, look up. When people feel anxious, they tend to look down. If you wanna feel peaceful, look up towards the ceiling, look up towards the sky. When you look up, it quiets that voice in your mind and gives you peace. You want to loosen your body. That's why going for a walk, laughing, smiling, exercising, all of that loosens your muscles. Take a hot shower, soak in a bath, trade massages with your spouse, right? All of that can lead to fun, relaxing activities. Might even lead to some other relaxing activities, right? So you can do some things that help you feel more peaceful and at ease. You focus your mind. You use the theater of your mind to prepare you. Your mind's like a movie theater. Whatever movie you play in your mind, that's how you're gonna feel. You can play comedies, dramas, or horror films, so choose wisely. So if you're gonna activate the relaxation response, you want to imagine what you want to have happen. Play desired outcomes in your mind. Transform worrisome thoughts, because they're gonna pop into your mind. You are going to have worrisome thoughts, stressful thoughts pop into your mind. That's okay, everybody does. It's what you do with those thoughts that matter. 
We're not being, we're not, we're being practical. We're being realistic. We're not saying that, you know, this stuff isn't going to happen and just trying to be Pollyannish, right? But we are saying that we're going to solve a problem or we're going to find a solution. So that's what I'm going to focus my attention on. How do I solve this problem? How do I find this solution? That's what we focus on. And the question that you ask yourself to start redirecting your mind is, what's the outcome that I want? What do I want to have happen? How do I want this to go? How do I want to feel right now? Who can I lean on for support? Right? What resources do we have? And when you start asking yourself these kinds of questions, it points your mind in a more empowering direction. If you have those scary fears, imagine shrinking them down like you have a shrinking spray. Shrink them down. Give them a little tickle. I get you, <laughs> right? It's a little pattern interrupt. And then throw them aside and say, okay, if I was fully present and powerful in this moment, if I could think like God, how would I think right now? If I had unlimited resources, how would I approach this right now? If I had total confidence, if I was totally peaceful, if I knew that at the end of this movie, it was going to be a, a happier ending, it was going to work out okay, how could I handle myself right now? How could I help others feel right now? And then stay in the present moment. And then finally, when you're using your language in your self-talk, Tell yourself that things are going to work out. Be encouraging, supportive, and kind to yourself and to others. If you're not real good at this, today's a perfect day to start practicing. And whatever you practice the most, you're going to get good at. Those are my three tips for how to take control and feel calm and peaceful. <laughs>